Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Macrotech Developers Limited Q3 FY23 Earnings Conference Call, hosted by Antic Stockbroking Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Biplav De Parma from Antic Stock Broking Limited. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Faizan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Q3 FY23 earnings call of Macrotech Developers Limited, hosted by Antic Stock Broking. Today we have with us the management of Macrotech Developers, represented by Mr. Abhishek Lodha. Managing Director and CEO, Mr. Shushil Kumar Modi, CFO, and Mr. Anand Kumar, Head IR. Without further ado, let me hand over the call to Mr. Loda. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Wishing you a very happy new year. May 2023 be full of good health and success for you and your family. Amidst all the global uncertainty of how high inflation can get to, how higher can interest rates go, how deep or how long can a recession in the developed world be? We ended yet another stable quarter in the direction of achieving a consistent counter-cyclical growth trajectory for our company. Worries that interest rates are getting uncomfortably higher in India for home loan borrowers, home prices are rising up rapidly, and tailwinds witnessed in the last couple of years will disappear or even turn into headwinds are coming unfounded. As a strategy, we have adopted the policy of reasonable pricing, and that basically means that at all times, we will try and ensure that home price growth uh, remains below wage and salary growth. YTD price growth has been about 5%, in line with our original guidance of 5 to 6% price growth for the full year. And we remain completely convinced that our thesis on the benefits of keeping price growth below wage growth and expanding the market will play out strongly in the years to come. Additionally, we have also supported our home buyers, particularly in the affordable and mid-income segments, by taking on some of the burden of the increased mortgage rates, which has come at a very minimal cost to our p &L. With all that that we have had, it has been a quite a satisfactory quarter in terms of pre-sales, with record pre-sales of over 3,000 crores, exactly 3,035 crores, growing 16% year on year which puts us well on track to meet our annual guidance. Equally, our new project addition has been more than satisfactory, well surpassing our guidance, and in the process ensuring growth in the quarters and years ahead. In spite of the significant investments in business development, we reduced our debt by 750 crores in this quarter. While we will achieve about 7,000 crores of net debt by the end of fiscal 23, we have shown that we can continue to grow while reducing debt, and this will be our theme for the next fiscal two, and we will continue to reduce our debt well below the peak limit, the limit or peak of one times of operating cash flow and 0.5 times equity debt that we've set for ourselves. Given the clear visibility of debt reductions, our debt, rate, our debt ratings, credit ratings have continued to improve, leading to our borrowing costs further coming down by 80 bips to 9.7%, from 10.5% at the start of the fiscal. This has to be seen in light of the 225 basis points hike by RBI in the same period. In any case, the balance sheet remains in an extremely comfortable and healthy position and only moving further in the right direction. Revenue and EBITDA had a year-on-year -year drop, year drop, but that is purely because of the revenue recognition method, uh, uh, which forces that revenue be recognized only for the projects which are completed in this quarter, which are really projects which were started maybe two and a half, three years ago. And the slightly lower margins were because, were because of the fact that, again, India has asked for cost to be recognized in line with the spend in the current quarter, whereas the revenues are recognized in line with only completions in the current quarter. As discussed on earlier calls, the, the real KPIs of our performance are pre-sales, the embedded EBITDA margin, new business addition, and ESG performance. The p &L revenue and EBITDA tend to be a lagging indicator of the business health. A few highlights for your reference. 
As I mentioned, we had our best ever Q3 pre-sales at 3,035 crores, growing 16% year on year. This is the second consecutive quarter that we've achieved 3,000 uh, crores uh, of pre-sales, showcasing the strength of the brand. And actually, in the calendar year 2022, we had three quarters out of four where we did more than 3,000 crores of pre-sales. And our total pre-sales for the calendar year 2022 were actually over 12,000 crores, uh, which is also ahead of our full year guidance for fiscal 23, which is at 11,500 crores. This only evidences the strength of the brand and the rising attraction that brand Loda carries amongst the consumer. Uh, with the recurring strong performance uh, uh, in the first three quarters of the year, we have already achieved pre-sales of 9,036 crores, which is higher than the pre-sales for the full year of fiscal 22, registering therefore a 62% year-on-year growth. In line with our commitment to provide more transparency, we started disclosing the profitability of our new pre-sales uh, done uh, since the last quarter. We believe that this would help our stakeholders and the financial community to also get a better sense not only on the trajectory of top-line growth, but also on the underlying profitability of the same. This embedded EBITDA margin, uh, which for this quarter now stands at, uh, is, is at about 31% of our pre-sales. The same for nine months of FY23 is at approximately 33%. The embedded EBITDA margin was achieved with uh, nearly one third of sales coming from our joint development project. Uh, over a slightly uh, longer horizon, as the benefit from the modest price increases flow through, we should continue to deliver 30% plus EBITDA margin, even as we hit the optimal misc of JDAs uh, of about, uh, being about 40% of our overall sales. This optimal miss of JDAs will also help us achieve our goal of 20% ROE. Based on this embedded EBITDA, one can derive the pro forma P&L for the quarter based on the pre-sales uh, uh, and looking at the embedded EBITDA of 33% for the pre-sales in the nine months up to fiscal 23, um, the, and then taking into account the cost of finance as well as a very modest cost of depreciation, et cetera, and are assuming the tax rate at around 25%. Uh, we can see that the underlying profitability of the business for the full year is likely to be um, in the range of about 1,900 crores of PAT. The collections uh, continue to remain uh, to track the pre-sales growth with a lag of about a quarter or so and came in at about 2,682 crores, showing a growth of 26% year on year. We expect collections to remain robust in the current quarter too, further aiding us to reduce debt. And while we reduce debt by about 750 crores, in the last quarter, uh, we expect to reduce uh, debt by almost 1,000 crores uh, in the current quarter. In, in terms of additional updates outside our core residential business, on the UK front, uh, the repatriation of uh, the monies coming back from London continues apace. Uh, in addition to 100 crores, which was repatriated in, in quarter two of, fiscal, of the current fiscal, we had approximately 155 crores further repatriated in the quarter three of fiscal 2023. 20, uh, we continue to have good visibility for the full repatriation uh, of approximately 1,000 crores, including the 155 crores which has come in in this last quarter to come through in calendar year 23, as we had uh, noted at the previous call. I also wanted to bring your attention to three areas which have the ability to contribute to value creation beyond our core residential business. We now have ready commercial assets with annual lease income potential of approximately 2.4 billion per annum. At a 7.5 per uh, cap rate, this is uh, over 30 billion of assets that we have available, which, are, which could be uh, over time a good source of both rental income and if, if and well, when relevant, also of uh, the cash flow from the disposal. Our green digital infra business which is a platform in partnership with Bain Capital and Ivano Cambridge, CDPQ, is growing well. We welcome Mr. D.S. Rawat uh, as the new CEO of the platform. Mr. Rawat was CEO of Bharti Infratel for almost 10 years um, uh, in his earlier roles. We expect the green digital infra business to start creating annuity income stream for us, and we expect this income stream to be um, almost 3 billion per annum by fiscal 26 
and then growing significantly further by the end of the decade. The third uh, element is our facilities management business, which is growing steadily as the underlying residential business is growing. And we are now augmenting this facilities management business with a digital services app. We expect this business to generate recurring fee income of approximately $1 billion per annum by fiscal 26, and then further growing significantly to almost $5 billion per annum by the end of the decade. Moving forward, on the cost side, uh, the construction costs have remained largely stable before the, uh, uh, stable with, with the previous quarter. Essentially now, for the seven quarters between March 21 and December 22, construction costs uh, uh, has increased as an annualized at an annualized rate of approximately 6%. Just to reiterate, construction cost intensity in India is quite modest as it accounts for just about a third of the sales value. In addition, within this construction cost bucket, almost one third of the cost is labor cost, which is plentifully available in India, especially when it comes to unskilled and semi-skilled labor, and therefore is not prone to any steep inflation. So in effect, it is only the commodities which are exposed to inflation and thus manageable in the overall cost. Our higher share of ready and near ready inventory further provide us with further cushion against inflationary pressures. Overall, the fact that construction cost inflation is now down to about 6% per annum is evidence of the fact that the impact of the geopolitical circumstances from last year is now starting to moderate. And we hope that not only will it help in having more predictable construction costs going forward, but also help in moderating the inflation in the overall economy and therefore help the, not, the rate cycle to start moving to a, uh, to a peak and then downwards later in this year. In terms of the land supply, we continue to see significant availability of land for us. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the call, we've added almost 18,000 crores, 178 billion of new projects in the nine months of this fiscal against our full, full year guidance of 150 billion. Uh, we believe that this is just an indication of the fact that not only landowners are bringing land to us, but they are also convinced about the fact that success in future projects will only come from a handful of players and therefore land availability will continue to remain reasonable or good for players like us. This consolidation of supply is a healthy trend for the industry and will ensure that in the longer term, the industry has disciplined supply dynamics as well as disciplined pricing. We, moving forward, at this stage, we do not see any amber flags on the demand environment, and my educated guess is we are close to the peak of the current interest rate cycle, which is also encouraging. Almost all the parameters on our PNL and balance sheet are looking upwards and very promising. As a company, very focused on ESG, in addition to our financial metrics, we are very proud of our continuing focus and performance on the ESG front. I am proud to inform you that we were rated as being among the top one percentile of real estate companies across the world by S&P's Global Corporate Sustainability Assessment. We also received a five-star rating from the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, GRESB, which, with a, which was, and that ranked us as the third best developer in all of Asia. To dive deeper into the reasons for these recognitions, and explain our future strategy in this regard. Today we have with us the head of our ESG initiatives on Abdullah and our social impact lead, Marika Shishodia. Before I hand over to them, I just want to provide a small capital market update as well. There has been no shortage of uncertainty and fragility year two, as it looks like so much attention has just gotten diverted towards China. In that environment, we have completed yet another important milestone in our journey with respect to capital markets. Following the, 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 this follows the numerous milestones achieved in the last two years, including most importantly the listing of our company, thereafter the raise of primary capital for debt reduction and growth, and finally now meeting the last hurdle to meet the minimum public shareholding criteria of 25%. We were the first company to use the QIP method to do an OFS. I can now safely say that we do not envisage any further equity issuance, primary or secondary, for quite some time now. In the process, the promoter group has also paid off its entire debt obligations and freed our shareholding in macrotech developers from all encumbrances. 
with the highest level of disclosures and corporate governance, not to mention of long-term secular growth prospects, we welcome our new marquee investors in the shareholder register and we relentlessly continue on the journey to become one of the most respected corporates. In conclusion, I will reiterate that this is just the second year of the 10 to 15 year housing cycle, which has started on the back of strong affordability, household income growth, and consolidated supply. We are now ending the year, and Q4 generally tends to be a strong quarter. And the early read of Q4 reinforces our belief of the industry being in a structural uptrend. We are confident of achieving our twin, twin objectives of 20% CAGR in pre-sales and about 20% ROE over the uh, medium term, at the same time keeping leverage well below one times operating cash flow and 0.5 times of our net worth. With this, I now hand over to On and Maika for a short brief on our ESG journey, and after that, Sushi and I will be available to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Today, uh, I would like to share our philosophy and performance on ESG. Uh, what we built today will last or even outlast this century, and it will see the environmental and socio-economic transition as it actually unfolds. Being a leader, we therefore shoulder a significant responsibility to do what is right because that will determine that this transition is just quick and bodes well for all. Uh, so it is clear that growth of our business uh, will actually be shaped to a large degree on how well we are able to converge our business goals with our ability to convert these risks into long-term value creation opportunities. And that's the basis of our do good, do well philosophy. Our projects are home to lakhs of residents. Uh, projects like Palava are a unique template of sustainable urbanization uh, in all aspects, uh, including experiential to environmental to socioeconomic. Uh, and we want to build upon that strength. Uh, our environmental strategy is built on two pillars of decarbonization and resilience. You must have uh, been aware of our 2035 operationally net zero target. Uh, which uh, we are sure that we'll achieve earlier than that. Uh, we have been able to reduce our GHG emissions by more than 50% in last five years. Today, our construction state, stage energy use comes mostly from renewable sources. All our projects are being built as green uh, projects, and through our ambitious initiative, that's Lodha Net Zero Urban Accelerator, uh, which we have formed with Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, who are a global think and do tank in the energy transition space. We are working on initiatives covering the entire spectrum of emissions in the built environment, uh, all the way from embodied carbons to operational carbon to even the emissions beyond our operational uh, boundary. Uh, we already treat 100% of wastewater and use it across our projects to enhance water resilience. We not only recharge the rainwater, but we enable its storage and use to lower our external water needs. We are working with experts to decipher the physical climate risks, thereby gaining the ability to take the right mitigation measures in right proportions. Our social strategy is currently focused on women empowerment, upskilling, and education. Uh, we have an ambitious gender diversity goal, and that goes with our best people practices and our ardent focus on uh, safety and well-being of people in our ecosystem. We are engaging deeply with our value chain uh, to partner in this journey and help us in a just transition. Uh, avoiding the risk of repetition, I'll, I'll let my colleague Mahika to shortly elaborate on some of our initiatives uh, on, in the social domain in a minute. Coming to governance, we believe that trust and transparency is the bedrock of any enterprise. Uh, although we have, been, uh, we, we have a short listed history, we have set a very strong governance benchmark for ourselves. As a private company, we have grown nearly 20 times in the last two decades. And in our view, such an unprecedented growth would not have been possible without a strong governance backbone and a very tall code of conduct. Uh, in terms of our board, uh, we have a very uh, active, diverse, and independent board that guides us in our journey. In fact, we are amongst those few companies which have an independent director as the chairman of the board. Our chairman, Mr. Mukund Chitle, uh, who uh, also sits on the board of LNT and was also the chairman of the Ethics Committee of Bombay Stock Exchange. 
the uh, the induction of uh, experts like uh, uh, Mr. Lee Polisano, Mr. Rajiv Bakshi, uh, Ms. Harita Gupta in last 18 months uh, as independent directors has helped us further enhance the expertise and diversity uh, of our board. Uh, I'll now end with our uh, measured ESG performance and position on various global uh, sustainability benchmarks, uh, which basically is a testament to our do good do well philosophy. You would have read uh, more in our first annual integrated report last year, where we detailed our systems, performance, and ongoing initiatives. Uh, all, all that and that track record has actually helped us perform well uh, in these benchmarks. Last year in November, we performed in the 99th percentile in the S&P Global Corporate Sustainability Benchmark. Uh, S&P Global CSA is the same assessment that is the basis of entry into Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Uh, while we are not in DGSI, we are proud to be uh, performing alongside the global, uh, the top global companies rated through this assessment. With a five-star badge, we are also ranked third in Asia in the development benchmark in Gresby 2022. Uh, we, we, have, we are also participating in some more and uh, will report as the results trickle in. Our approach of participating in these benchmarks is that it helps us learn and improve. Uh, it helps us quantify our ESG and also aid in continuously enhancing our transparency. Uh, we foresee that uh, the set of the, with our strategy and the set of actions that we are already taken, uh, taking, we will, uh, we will continue to lead this space. Uh, with this, I hand over to Mahika to update on our social impact and initiatives. Over to Mahika. Thank you, On. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the Loda Group, just like its business, has an audacious vision for its impact on society. Our focus areas in social impact are women empowerment and education. We are working on two large programs with a vision of building the prosperity and power of our nation. I will first speak about our work on women empowerment. As you know, our country has amongst the lowest female workforce participation rate at about 18%. The reality is that working women in India do two jobs, one managing the household responsibilities and other is their regular job. We observe that the largest drop in female workforce participation is after marriage or after having children. This significantly reduces the work life of women. Our country is not only paying a huge economic cost of an underutilized workforce, but also a social cost by marginalizing women. To solve for this, our program Unnati brings work to women rather than them traveling to work. At 20 minutes walking distance from our low-cost housing developments, we are providing workspaces at 75% discount to companies that can absorb at least 500 women in the vicinity into their workforce. These workspaces, or Lakshmi Bhavan, will provide the right enabling environment for women to work consistently, productively, and safely. Our aim is to create 100,000 new jobs in the next five years. As part of our efforts, we are mobilizing the female workforce, providing job-appropriate skill training, and developing daycare facilities for children. We believe that such an environment will reduce workforce attrition among females and improve work product productivity. We recently kicked off our first pilot in Palava and are focusing on the BSSI, telecom, textile, and food services sector to provide jobs to match the profiles of the first cohort of women. The second initiative, the Lodha Genius Program, is in the education space. We are developing a program in partnership with leading Indian universities to help the brightest students across our country achieve their full potential. The program fills a critical gap in the education sector in India where differential needs of gifted students is often ignored. Most of them have high academic scores and it is assumed that they need no additional support. To bring out the best in these students, they need to be supported academically, socio-emotionally, and financially. The Lodha Genius Program will identify such students across the country and support them from 8th grade by providing academic exposure, opportunities for growth, financial support, and mentorship. The program is strongly rooted in the values of nation building and a sense of contributing back to society. Both these programs will have a huge impact on the lives of people. 
Let me stop here and hand it over to Sushil. Thank you. Thanks, Sean, and thanks, Maika. With that, I think uh, we can, uh, you know, we uh, we can take the, all your <coughs> questions or queries around the performance, please. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question, press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one. The first question is from the line of Saurabh from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Vishesh. Uh, hi, Deep. Uh, so thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, my first question is, you know, you said that the impact of uh, mortgage increases on demand is not uh, not very significant yet, but have you seen any slowdown in terms of footfalls on your site or anything? You know, your pre-sales are still good, but in terms of footfalls, have you seen any slowdown? And if rates were to go to 9.25, uh, where do you think, uh, you know, the, at what point do you think the demand kind of slows down? So that's the first one. <clears throat> the second one is essentially on the on slide 12, where you've kind of given this embedded, embedded disclosure. So is the overhead calculation based the current run rate or, I mean, you've taken a two-year out run rate of your overheads to get to the 32% beta? And the third question is essentially there is the guidance for 70 billion rupees of net debt by March 23, that's light 10. That's still intact, right? So do you have three months. Thank you. Thanks for uh, your last uh, question was not very clear. Could you just th repeat the third question? Yeah, so the slide uh, 10, so you have this 70 billion net debt by March 23. Uh, we are at 80 billion. So that, so we are expecting about a 10 billion odd reduction in this quarter. Will that be a way to think about it? Uh, thank you. Understood. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, in terms of our, uh, you know, what we are seeing in the demand environment, and we measure it in a number of ways. We measure it in terms of, uh, uh, incoming inquiries, we measure it in terms of footfalls, we measure it in terms of conversion rates. And whichever metric one has seen, one has found that the desire for home ownership, there has been no flagging of that over the last nine months, in spite of the significant, uh, uh, you know, uh, in spite of the significant increase uh, in the mortgage rates. To give you an example, the total number of footfalls that we had coming into our sites in December, which again, due to holidays and other things, tends to not be such a strong month, was almost 10,000 families walked in. And uh, that uh, is, you know, as high, uh, it's probably the second highest uh, in any month of the year. So uh, one has not seen any flagging of footfalls, nor, has, nor have conversion rates uh, reduced per se, which is really reflected in the fact that we've delivered uh, uh, the 9,000 odd crores of sales uh, in nine months. In terms of your second question around overhead costs, we estimate our company's overhead costs uh, on the basis of, of the uh, project's uh, uh, entire life cycle, and that is taken into account when one is looking at the EBITDA, uh, the embedded EBITDA margin. If you look at the explanation at the bottom of slide five, you will note that we explain that embedded EBITDA is calculated taking into account the actual sales price that the unit is sold at less or, and then we reduce, uh, we, uh, uh, we take into account the life cycle costs, which are all life cycle costs, including construction, overhead, uh, and so on with only finance costs obviously not deducted uh, from the EBITDA number. So, so that is taking into account life cycle costs. Uh, in terms of your third question around debt reduction, yes, uh, we are looking at reducing debt by approximately 10 billion INR in the current quarter. As you would have noted with significant investment in uh, land and approvals, we were able to reduce our debt by almost uh, 750 crores, 7.5 billion uh, in the last quarter, and we are feel pretty good uh, about uh, being able to further reduce it by a slightly higher quantum in the current quarter. Not only that, 
I think even going forward, I would like to clarify to you as well as all our um, uh, uh, all the others on the call that our guidance of debt at about 60 billion uh, is our peak debt number, which is really comes out of our limit of debt, our peak debt being one times operating cash flow and 0.5 times um, equity. But given the fact that we have been able to consistently show growth while reducing leverage, we expect our debt to continue to reduce through fiscal 24 and therefore be meaningfully lower than the 60 billion number. Okay, understood. And just one last question, what will be the mix of JD and pre-sales for this year? For the quarter, uh, sorry, it was around 33 or percent. But for the year, for the nine months, it would be somewhere around 23%. So perhaps for the year, it should settle somewhere around 25, 26 is what we can estimate uh, sitting today. Okay, and this will grow to about mid 30s longer term. Uh, around 40% is our sort of stable state, yes, is what we expected. Got it. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Lakhan from CLSA, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, so just a question on the on the guidance side. So we have we have uh, done well on the pre-sales and uh, we are likely to exceed uh, uh, for the full year. Uh, but on the operating cash flow side, we have been, uh, we have lagged the, the guidance, right? So so what, what is happening here? Like, you know, are, are we like, is it because of the collections are lagging or are we spending more or uh, uh, is it a combination of both? So on the cash flow, I know actually we are reasonably tracking as you would have seen we have indicated too. So not that uh, the cash flow it is uh, we have any kind of negative adverse uh, uh, you know, performance. It's just the kind of investment or the kind of business growth that is going hand in hand in tandem, which automatically then decides potentially from the cash flow how much uh, the debt debt reduction happens. So it's just a function of that and which is where we continue to remain confident that 1,000 crore minimum we would reduce in this running quarter. Sure, sure. Um, just a related question on that. So, so the dividends, uh, dividend policy that we had, right, set out last year or beginning of this year, um, uh, said that, you know, 15 to 20% of the PAT you would pay out as dividends. Now, for the PAT purpose, would you consider the reported PAT, which uh, where, you know, you have the provisioning of 1,100 crores odd, or would you consider the adjusted part? Uh, uh, so, just trying to understand that. No, in all fairness, we would be looking for an adjusted part, taking out any extraordinary uh, measures such as like this. But obviously, the policy suggests the perhaps the max that we would be considering. How much we would be considering will be a function of, as is stated in the policy. Equally, the the our capital structure, vis a vis the business growth that is ongoing. So as a combination of all of these, we will get to uh, uh, get to uh, arrive at in consultation with the board a rightful number as dividend, which when we declare in any case so that you note, would be kind of paid out more like September, October, because it will be more like a final dividend, so after the shareholders approval. Sure, sure, that's, that's helpful. And uh, lastly, on on the accounting side, right? We uh, we say that our embedded EBITDA margin is uh, is better than the reported EBITDA because of the provisioning or because of the uh, the period costs. But you know, just trying to understand this, right? You know, we we say you know whatever is recording getting recorded in our PNL, uh, those projects must have also had their period costs, right? So if you're talking about 1.9 million square feet of deliveries. Uh, against 2.3 million square feet of new launches, uh, to which the period costs have been you know, allocated to. So I'm just trying to understand, like, so more or less, you know, over a period of time, that should get netted off, right? So, I mean, isn't that the way one should look at it? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, while uh, the principle of what you're saying is absolutely correct, what has to be taken into account is the differential rate of growth. Uh, the uh, current period costs are uh, basis the fact that the organization is uh, running at a 12 uh, at 11 and a half thousand crores plus sales run rate and equally you know construction and business development and and all of those activities in the uh, 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 over a medium term obviously the embedded ebitda margin that we are reporting and the adjusted ebitda which will actually be 
uh, uh, be in the PNL, they will converge. And they and if you see over the last few years, on an ongoing basis, our quarterly uh, numbers when it comes to adjusted P, uh, EBITDA are uh, in a, between the 30 and 35 percent range. So the percentage wise, it will be the case. But when one looks at absolute numbers, because they, when one is looking at the period cost. Uh, it is an absolute quantum which is deducted from the lower revenue which is recognized. Uh, and that is what affects, or we, that's why we say is that the PNL revenue and the PNL EBITDA are lagging indicators, whereas when one looks at the pre-sales and the embedded EBITDA, one can get a much more real-time picture of the performance of the business. So just so that you understand, you know, uh, the in any case, our embedded EBITDA percentage uh, that we are indicating is pretty much tracking the current performance as well, as you would have seen adjusted EBITDA even for be it nine months or be it for the quarter is in the range of around 32%, so pretty much on track. What you are not getting effectively is a flow through of that EBITDA to the PAC, which is on account of our past uh, past, you know, capital structure being squeezed towards debt, where the significant amount of interest got, got capitalized and gets, uh, uh, you know, hits the PNL uh, included in the cost of projects. So as we kind of, as our trajectory on the net debt reduction continues, then effectively all of that kind of completely wipes out, and which is what when you see the pro forma PNL, we have indicated for the current year on an average debt that we would have for this current year. Our interest cost, finance cost would be around 1000 odd crore. And we have taken the entire 1000 crore in the performer PNL, showing it coming into the PNL as is. And then what should be the PVT or a PAC? Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks so much and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Samir Baisiwala from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Vishik, just on the uh, new project uh, acquisition side, JDA, um, uh, how's the outlook for you know next 12 months in the sense that is the space getting very competitive from a bidding point of view? And for the deals that you have done so far, um, what's the sort of a typical you know uh, uh, landowner? You know, is it an industrial or if you can just uh, share some light on that? Uh, hi, Smith. Uh, sure. So our BD, uh, what would I say? Our BD cup is flowing over as it stands right now. Uh, uh, it's not only seen in terms of the quantum that we've been able to do in nine months, but also in terms of what the pipeline is and how much of deal inflow is coming through. So very clearly, we see that uh, we are quite the preferred choice, uh, especially in the, the our focus cities of Mumbai and Pune uh, for joint development. And we are seeing a very steady pipeline uh, there. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, in terms of your question around who are the providers of this land, yes. it's a wide mix. There are landowners, there are, you know, uh, financial institutions who are, you know, who have historically been stuck with some assets. Uh, there are developers who are stressed, um, uh, and uh, you know, so it's a it's a wide mix as it has been over the last 20 months as we have sort of you know added almost 30,000 crores uh, plus of new projects. Okay, and at any point in time, uh, uh, Abhishek, are you thinking of reverting back to you know outright purchase of land? And for Bangalore, is there any update? And would JDA be the uh, be the principal way of expansion over there? Uh, uh, Samir, in terms of Bangalore, we are in what we call the seed phase. Uh, the seed phase is where we glow, grow, do a few projects, deliver the projects. Uh, so that's really why we entered Bangalore almost three years before we really needed to enter for growth purposes. Almost all our growth up to fiscal 26 is going to come from Mumbai and Pune. Uh, Bangalore, we are using this time to establish our brand, become local, establish the strong operating uh, structure and team. And uh, we continue to be operating with a low risk model, which is uh, JDA uh, driven. Uh, in terms of whether we will acquire land outright, the answer of course is yes. As you will note in our uh, presentation, uh, we expect our medium term mix to be about 60% uh, outright and 40% JDA. 
So obviously, you know, we are moving from a situation where we were almost 100% outright and are now slowly over the next 18 odd months going to get close to the 40% JDA mark. This will also be the time period in which we have, you know, uh, corrected our balance sheet uh, through a combination of capital raise and operating cash flow generation. You saw last quarter, uh, um, uh, and in the in this year overall, we would reduce debt by almost 2,500 crores, which is all organic. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, you know, uh, it has been uh, quite, uh, I would say, uh, uh, useful. Uh, uh, for us to use the JDA model to keep growing while we have uh, uh, made our balance sheet as strong as we'd like it to be. Uh, over uh, with the strong operating cash flows that we have, you know, close to 60 billion this year, a higher number next year, we'll of course give detailed guidance in our April call. Um, uh, we expect to have uh, the ability to of course acquire land outright. The JDA will, like I said, be about 40%, the balance being outright. Okay, great, thanks. Just one final question from my side. Avishik, uh, you know, Macrotech has always been known to be more of a South Central Mumbai company, you know. So uh, so, uh, so I can see on slide 22 you have 1.2 million square feet of owned land and then uh, nothing. So first of all, I mean, this is all in the park uh, project. And the second is, Going forward, how do you plan to, you know, continue your, you know, dominant position in this market, micro market? Uh, Samir, uh, you know, uh, we have, uh, as you rightly pointed out, about 1.2 million square feet of own land and then about 1.7 million square feet of JDA land in south and central Mumbai, totaling to about uh, 3 million square feet uh, currently. Uh, are uh, beyond, of course, uh, whatever is, uh, you know, under construction as well as uh, 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 what is ready and unsold. So there is, uh, there is quite a, uh, I would say, significant uh, quantum available uh, with us. If you look at the numbers, we have about ready unsold of 37 billion and ongoing unsold of 70 billion. So that in itself is almost 110 billion uh, that we have. And in addition, beyond that, uh, we have 3 million square feet uh, and, you know, you can uh, ascribe whatever value, let's say another 100 billion to that. So between the two buckets, uh, that's more than 200 billion uh, of uh, inventory that we have, which is a good three years uh, plus uh, of sales in the market. So we see very good uh, and, you know, given our strong performance in this market, the, the marquee quality of projects that we deliver, the business development pipeline also is very strong. So, you know, very clear visibility, as you will already have noted, for the next three to four years and very uh, significant business development uh, which is available for us. So we don't see any uh, concern uh, um, in terms of our ability to continue to provide high quality product to the South and Central Mumbai market. Okay, no, that's uh, great. That's very clear. And 0.9 million is all in park, right? You're talking about the 0.9 the, million of the beyond, line, 12 months, beyond 12 months, slide 22. No, uh, that's that's our project in Prabha Devi. Uh, that's uh, uh, partly in Prabha Devi, uh, and and partly uh, there is uh, another location. Uh, so park, I think uh, almost everything will be under ongoing unsold. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pritesh Shet from Motilal Oswal. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, first question on you know, Mumbai as a market uh, from overall, you know, macro perspective. Uh, we have seen, you know, upsurge in demand in the last two years. I think Mumbai has been one of the best market, uh, but now, over the last probably five, six months, uh, the volumes uh, which we see in, the, in terms of registration as well as the consultants that report have been kind of steady. There hasn't been, hasn't been much growth. Uh, what is your outlook on, you know, Mumbai as a market? Will we continue to see growth in terms of the industry volumes that, uh, you know, the, currently the region is blocking in? Uh, and how do you see, uh, you know, the upcoming infrastructure development, uh, you know, helping uh, boost uh, further uh, demand? Uh, hi, Pritesh. Uh, thank you. That's an important question. Uh, our view is that Mumbai is at a cusp of a breakout uh, driven by two things. 
One, of course, is the infrastructure creation, which has been in the works for almost a decade now. But a number of those projects will culminate in the next 24 months, and I think those are going to be really game-changing for Mumbai, including the Trans Harbour Link, the coastal roads, several arms of the metro, and a lot of many other not as prominent projects. Uh, this, I, uh, I think, is coming at the right time for Mumbai because I think in India now, uh, we are going to see uh, the impact of manufacturing-led uh, uh, leg of growth in addition to, of course, the strong services leg that India has. And as uh, capital investment, uh, whether under the PLI scheme or otherwise, whether led by the domestic consumption or the China plus one strategy, all of these fructify, uh, Mumbai is likely to be an outsized beneficiary of uh, that through front office as well as banking. Uh, so, uh, so generally we believe that Mumbai is very well poised uh, uh, because of these things that I mentioned. Uh, however, uh, in our own internal assessment, we remain uh, to do our numbers on a conservative basis. We expect nominal growth in the Mumbai market to be in the 10 to 11 percent range with a mix of, you know, about 5 percent to 6 percent in price and the balance in terms of volume. Uh, so generally, you know, we are expecting Mumbai market nominal growth to be, uh, uh, you know, we are, our internal assumptions being conservative are below nominal GDP growth. Uh, got it. Fair enough. And just a follow-up on that, uh, I think uh, initially while, you know, we were targeting the markets like Western Suburbs, Eastern Suburbs, uh, as well as Pune, uh, Navi Mumbai was also one of the markets where we were looking for uh, growth opportunities, but I think we haven't uh, you know, materialized anything in that. Any specific challenges that we are facing in that market and, you know, what's uh, your project or addition outlook in that in that market? Um, uh, that's a very good read. You're right that uh, most of our new project additions have been in the other markets you mentioned, including western suburbs, eastern suburbs, and Pune, in addition to the three markets of South Central Mumbai, extended eastern suburbs, and Thane, where we've historically been very strong. Uh, Navi Mumbai and eastern uh, suburbs is a joint market for us, um, and uh, we continue to, uh, we have opportunities available in the Navi Mumbai market. Uh, we have just found that the profitability levels there are not as strong as what we are comfortable with and therefore we've been choosy in picking uh, what to work on. Uh, uh, we continue to evaluate opportunities but, but you know as we've said in a different context uh, we are not only chasing top line, we are chasing profitable top line and therefore we'll always be disciplined in the kind of projects we take up where both the top line and the bottom line should be uh, uh, you know understandable by us. Uh, great, that, that's quite clear. Just one last question. I think you mentioned in your initial commentary that uh, the embedded EBITDA margin, even if we are at a full-scale contribution from JDA, that is at 40%, the EBITDA margin can remain at 30% kind of a range uh, versus, uh, you know, the, uh, in presentation you have mentioned the mix. Probably we are calculating at 25%. Uh, so... Uh, you know, just a clarification of that, whether 30% can be achievable uh, with 40% JDA contribution or, uh, you know, I misunderstood something. So we do expect uh, that even as the contribution from JDA stabilizes around 40%, that given a combination of our scale and therefore our ability to uh, make sure that construction costs are continuing to be value engineered, and uh, our overhead costs also, given the larger scale, are improving, plus the price growth that one is seeing in the okay. marketplace, which adds to margin, we will be able to maintain the approximate 30% um, uh, of in terms of our EBITDA margin, uh, even with the 40% uh, contribution from JDAs. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, there may be a quarter where it may become 29, another quarter where it may be 32, but you know, over, you know, any meaningful period, uh, that 30% should be achievable. It is actually, you can do the math straight, right? Uh, the difference between the outright and the JDA typically would be somewhere around, let's say, 10 to 12%. And if you just, uh, you know, extrapolate to the fact that we would have 25 odd percent of JDA mixed this year, and even if you go to the 40% in the FY24, that means incremental 15%. Uh, on that, if you take the 12% equation being played out, the differential between the two uh, land model, 
you know, the net impact would be somewhere around 2%. And that 2%, if you then look at from a price rise standpoint, price rise being around 5-6%, even if netted down with any construction cost inflationary impact, if at all has to further play out uh, for any conservatism, you can safely see that that will get reasonably offset with the price rise and thereby 30% uh, you know, in itself perhaps uh, should not have any challenge, uh, maybe even more. Great, great. That's what I wanted to clarify. Uh, thanks, thanks for that answer and uh, all the best. That's it from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Alpesh Thakkar from Antic Stock Broking Limited. Please go ahead. Um, hello. Thank you for taking my question. So my first question is kind of continuation from one of the previous questions that we had. So as we understand that, you know, we are in the midst of a strong housing up cycle. And uh, this comes with increased expectation of every stakeholder, including the landowners. So just want to make sure that how do we ensure that we, we still make reasonable returns on the projects that we get into? So so what is the thought process behind that? And how do we ensure that we do not get into projects which are not really very profitable or uh, meet our benchmarks? Uh, uh, I'll be just an important question. Uh, two things uh, you will have to take into consideration as you determine, uh, you know, uh, how landowners uh, are thinking about the situation. Uh, point number one is that with the steady consolidation in the industry, uh, while the quantum of land supply is the same or similar or may even get higher as prices move up, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the number of takers of that land are limited. And therefore, the negotiating leverage or negotiating power is tilted towards those who are taking the land. Uh, that's uh, one element. The other element, especially in the joint development model, is that the landowners continue to benefit from the upside in pricing. So they need not push hard on the percentage of revenue or uh, profit that they would get because in absolute terms, as the market strengthens, uh, they will benefit from that upside too. So uh, we have not seen any circumstance uh, uh, or uh, anecdotes right now where we see undue uh, pressure. Obviously, every <clears throat> landowner wants to make sure they get a good deal, but the good deal is not only the percentage of profit or revenue. It also includes, you know, who is the partner, how, what is the transparency, uh, how likely is the project's time frame and price realization going to be close to business plan, what is ultimately going to be the NPV. So all these factors are being taken into account by the landowners, and we don't see any undue pressure on the land costs. Okay. Okay, sure. Thanks, this makes sense. And my second question is, you know, I'm referring to the slide where you guys provide, you know, price inflation of different materials. Uh, there we see sharp increase in lifts and elevator costs. So so how should one deal it? So what has really gone wrong there? So what is the reason behind that? That's it from my side. Uh, uh, Alpesh, hi. I don't really know the specific question. Uh, that's not okay. an area of a specific answer. I can only guesstimate that given the lockdowns in China and because China tends to be, uh, you know, a provider of both input materials as well as finished goods in the elevator space, one may have seen, uh, you know, uh, a spike and because it's a December 22 number, you may see that, you know, up to March 22 the impact was limited but then suddenly you saw a, a much bigger impact in uh, uh, this period up to December 22. But we will do a deep dive and hopefully be able to give you an offline answer on that. Okay, okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the clarification. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhinav Sinha from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask a question on the digital infra side. So you have put up uh, some numbers on slide number 17. Uh, so can you just provide some clarity on uh, you know uh, the area under development and area under construction? Uh, what does this mean? Is this uh, you know what we have uh, left as part of JV where we can earn earnings, etc. So that's one. And uh, also on this, uh, what is the cost of the Kulla land parcel? And uh, you've also given some longer term targets for this business. Can you just elaborate that? Thank you. So I think your first question, if I understood correctly, is what is the difference between area under development versus area under construction? Area under development is the total land which we've acquired and started infrastructural activities around. 
area under construction is where the physical construction of the box has started. Uh, so that's the two. So you can read it as saying that we have approximately 5.7 million square feet, uh, which is available for development and the infrastructure activities around that have started, out of which 1.4 million square feet are under construction as physical boxes. Uh, so that was uh, one. In terms of the consideration uh, for the Kurla line, uh, the exact amount was Yeah, I uh, I will. Uh, I think it's approximately 150 crores. Uh, 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 we will get you with the exact uh, the exact figure. Uh, and I think uh, while your line was a little unclear, the last question you had is what are our plans or growth plans in this area? Uh, as yeah. you are aware, the platform uh, is uh, earmarked a, a very significant amount of investment into this area. We believe that warehousing and industrial are secular growth stories in India and are supply constrained. And uh, we expect to scale this platform up meaningfully in the next three years, such that our share of income, which is our one-third share in the PropCo, plus RP income from managing the OPCO, uh, will be approximately 3 billion INR uh, by fiscal 26. Okay. Uh, also, just I may ask one last question quickly. Uh, the worldly world towers, uh, I think, was now completed, right? Um, so, by when are we uh, expecting to monetize it, and uh, will we go for say a part monetization as it pleases, or uh, you would like to do it in one shot? So, uh, as you have noticed, we have about 30 billion worth of uh, office or retail assets, which are, uh, you know, ready or almost ready. Uh, now, including the one load place office building which you mentioned. Um, in terms of our monetization plan, we do not have a clear uh, uh, decision yet on the form of monetization. Obviously, we do not expect to continue to hold it long term on our books. Our current focus is on leasing. The leasing activity has started off well. Uh, we are having a number of marquee clients, including companies like Condé Nast and uh, Gucci, who have signed on. And uh, we are focused now on leasing the building out. And once the leasing activity substantially progress, we will decide on what's the best way of uh, monetizing the asset. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kushagra from Old Bridge Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, I thank for the opportunity. Just one question. Uh, so, if I look at your... Sorry to interrupt uh, you, Kushagra. Mr. Kushagra, the audio is not clear from your line. Please use the handset mode. Yes. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Mr. Kushagra, please go ahead with your question. As there is no response from the current participant, we'll move on to the next question from the line of Parvez Kazi from Newama. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, good afternoon, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, so uh, my question is regarding our township business. So what is the kind of pre-sales that we saw from that segment in Q3, and what are the uh, future launch pipeline in that segment? Thank you. Uh, the township business is classified largely under what we call extended eastern suburbs. So if you look at the details on slide 20 of our presentation, uh, you will note that we had about 5.5 billion INR uh, of pre-sales uh, from the extended eastern suburbs. And uh, we obviously have very significant land holdings uh, in our developments there. The number for the nine months so far is just under 17 billion INR. And uh, we expect uh, that that segment will grow to over 20, 22 billion INR or thereabouts uh, for the full year. Um, the launch pipeline uh, is quite significant. Uh, you know, for those who are in Mumbai, you may have even seen an ad this morning uh, of a new segment, which is the crown segment in, uh, in Dombivili. And uh, we continue to add in new, uh, new segments, like including plotting, 
uh, higher end aspirational housing, uh, the continuing uh, mid income housing under our Casa brand, then lower down more affordable housing under um, under the uh, the Crown by Loda brand. We're doing office spaces there uh, uh, in terms of uh, for sale, Tata office sales. Uh, so we're seeing a number of different uh, drivers uh, of uh, uh, product uh, um, uh, from the, on the product side. There's a lot of interesting uh, and positive infrastructure activity in that area. The Thane Dombivili Link Road is now physically complete and should be open for operations in the next three months, which will make Upper Thane uh, uh, just a 10-minute drive to Dombivili West Station. Uh, the uh, the Nasik. Uh, the, the Nagpur Samruddhi Mahamarg will also touch uh, the Upper Thane project on one side and that will make the drive uh, from Upper Thane will basically become the gateway to Mumbai for all of Northern Maharashtra. Uh, similarly, in Palawa, we have seen a lot of augmentation of roads. The Aeroli tunnel uh, work, it looks like it is quite a bit progress and will make Aeroli a predictable 20 minutes away from Palawa, which will be, uh, which we expect to be a meaningful contributor to additional demand. And we also are seeing other activities. So overall, we feel quite bullish about the reset in the townships business, uh, both helping reset in terms of pricing as well as in terms of volumes. And we do expect that maybe from fiscal 25 onwards, you will see a meaningful shift upwards in the total contribution uh, from the townships business. Uh, thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kushagra from Old Bridge Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Is this better now? Yes, sir. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just one question. Uh, so, uh, if I look at your uh, GDA signings launch time plan uh, uh, on slide 15, uh, uh, and if I compare this uh, with your uh, earlier uh, uh, disclosures, uh, just curious to know that majority of the timelines have sort of postponed, like for example, uh, certain projects uh, uh, which were about to get launched in starting FY23 or mid of FY23 have been uh, sort of uh, uh, postponed to FY24. I remember uh, one of the key differentiating factors uh, for JD signings, uh, which we have highlighted, are the lower launch timelines from the date of signings, right? So, sh I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, should, or should we read anything over there? Uh, no, I think, you know, the fact is that if a sh if anything shifts by a month or two months, uh, you will see it as shifting from fiscal 23 to fiscal 24 because you're in the last quarter of fiscal 23. Uh, so uh, that's that's about it. Uh, we actually, oh. if you look at it uh, from our new projects launches, uh, which is probably the better way to read what we are launching and what time it is taking to get us to launch, which is I think the previous uh, slide number uh, uh, slide number 14, and then there is a detailed uh, uh, summary of that also. Uh, you will continue to see that our launch activity is very robust. You will see it on slide 13 that our launch activity is quite robust, and that is summarized on on slide 14. So yes. really, no no change uh, no change in in a, in how we are able to get projects to market timely. Often, you know, a one or two month swing will happen, but uh, when you when you see it in the last quarter of the year, it will look like a year has shifted. Yes, yes, yes. Totally understand that. Uh, sure, sure. Thanks, guys, and all the rest. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Thank you everyone for joining the call. Uh, it was a pleasure to answer all your questions. Feel free to reach out to me or Sushil for any further updates. I will be happy to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Antic Stock Broking Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your line.